When I was a child, I devoured every book I could get my hands on. I loved losing myself in colorful and dramatic stories. And my absolute favorite was this, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Everything about it electrified me. And when I reread Dahl's books as an adult, they surprised me. There was nothing prescriptive or predictable about them with little sense of narrative rules. And they're nearly all perfect. Boy pie might be better than bird pie, he went on, grinning horribly. More meat and not so many tiny little bones. Mr Twit is a very evil man, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. The Twits, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Matilda, Fantastic Mr Fox. Legendary books that take Roald Dahl's sales to 100 million worldwide. He is one of the best-selling fiction authors of all time. I think Dahl is possibly the first modern children's author. He was the first one who broke the rules, as it were, and sided so utterly with the child. Children's books are often seen as the poor relation of literature. But children are just as demanding as adult readers if not more so. I should know, I'm a children's writer myself, yet I will never be as good as Dahl. In this film, I want to try and understand where Dahl's magic touch came from. When I was growing up in the 1970s and 80s, Dahl was a regular on television. As a child, I was quite scared of him. If a bucket of paint falls on a man's head, that's funny. If the bucket fractures his skull at the same time and kills him, that's not funny, it's tragic. He was unfeasibly tall and bald and dressed like a mad professor. He came across like an eccentric and cantankerous uncle. He was an outsider who sat alone all day, dreaming up wicked stories. His persona was so strong that people even parodied him. By the end of his life, it was like he'd become one of his characters. He was tall, he was distinguished, he was marvellous to look at, a marvellous looking man. Rather like the North Pole, or whatever it is that attracts the solar wind from the sun. He would magnetise you and then in some way rebuff you at the same time. So he wasn't the sort of person who you'd run up and throw your arms around. I wouldn't anyway. I would have liked her. I've come to his home in Buckinghamshire, where he spent 30 years writing stories for both children and adults. His widow, Lissy Dahl, still lives at the house. Hello. Hello, Lissy. <laughs> Thank you so Welcome much for having us. Thank you. Gypsy house. Thank you. Not at all. Come on in. Can I take your oh, coat? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Your coat. Wow. That's one bookcase. Yes, isn't it wonderful? So this is the Chinese. That was the first, poetry. yes. First of Bra's books to be printed in China. It's printed kind of a horrible cover paper. as well. It's isn't absolutely it? horrible. <laughs> Was he very private about his work? It very, yes. Uh, I, we, he would sort of suddenly say, I've got a little idea for a, my new book. And, you know, I think little boy who's able to move objects around and you say, fine. And that would be about it. And then he'd go off into his hut and you wouldn't hear any more until there was roughly a... F uh, where he'd got a first draft more or less ready. And would he let you read the first draft? No, no, he'd read it to me. Oh. 
and he'd read it to me in bed and sometimes I fell asleep and uh, that was um, not very good. Did he have any negative feelings about writing for children rather than adults? No, I think he probably had more fun. Because um, his adult stories are quite dark. When he started to write for children, I think that's part of the charm. He points out how, bad, how badly adults do behave, and of course children love that. But no, I think, I think he got far more fun out of writing for children. There were moments that the establishment rejected him, or he felt they rejected him, because he was a children's writer. Uh, you know, that was not the thing to be, you know. And, and I think that upset him quite a bit. Every day, Roald Dahl walked to his writing hut in the garden. This was the womb that gave birth to all his stories. Despite the gorgeous view, Dahl chose to seal himself off with curtains. He closed himself away, like Willy Wonka in his factory. Here's the hut. Not quite as I imagined it. I was thinking it was going to be a shed for some reason, but it's a, a brick building. But I love this, this walkway. It feels like you'd have had a real routine hanging at the house, taking this walk, whatever the weather. Quite a long way from the house as well. He definitely wanted to be isolated. To better understand where Dahl's extraordinary imagination came from, I've come to Cardiff, which was one of Britain's largest ports in the early 20th century. Through its maritime trading with Norway, it became home to a large Norwegian community, including Dahl's parents. Born in 1916, Dahl's childhood was overshadowed by tragedy. At just three years old, he lost both his elder sister and his father to illness. He formed a very close relationship with his mother. I think Sophia Hesselberg Dahl was an extraordinary, forceful, strong woman. She was a mystic. She read people's fortunes. She was a tough old bird, as he might have said. Rode's mother read him Norwegian fairy tales as he was growing up. To find out how these stories may have influenced the young Dahl, I've come to the Norwegian church in Cardiff, where he was baptized. I'm meeting with Giles Abbott, an expert in storytelling with an interest in Norwegian myths. So, Giles, what's distinctive about Norwegian fairy tales? They have a very distinctive context. The isolated, snowbound land and mountains land of Norway. They have a distinctive flavour as well. There's a, there's a humour, there's a darkness, and there's trolls. So what is a troll? Trolls are usually stupid. They can be outwitted by clever, clever human beings. Could be me you're describing here. <laughs> Could it be? I don't know. And I think they often take on qualities of nature, so a, a troll can have a rock-like aspect, or, or they, sometimes if, when the sun comes up, they turn into rocks. Well, if you've ever seen rocks, you can sort of see a face. Yeah. You can imagine how that would happen, couldn't you? Wow, so there's kind of threat everywhere in these stories. Yes. Nature even can't be trusted. Well, nature can't. Well, and in particular, in a land as challenging as Norway. There's threat and danger everywhere in those dark forests, in those great lakes, and those behind those great mountains. I, I have a friend who grew up in uh, Norway in the, in the 1940s, and she says that the trolls would be things like, if you see a tree covered in snow, it can take on a humanoid shape, but it's massive. And she also said that whenever her family met with other branches of their family, the first thing they would do is they would sit down and the older people would tell troll stories to the children. Yeah, you can imagine like the young Dahl asking for the most macabre stories oh, and yeah. asking his mother to hear them over and over again. In The Witches, mm -hmm. and the boy hero is told stories by his grandmother, and this is what Rod writes. My grandmother was Norwegian. The Norwegians know all about witches for Norway. 
with its black forests and icy mountains, is where the first witches came from. Oh, what a lovely Fantastic, but amazing mm. that he connects Norway... And the landscape. Yeah, to, to witches, to, to horrifying things. Witches of Inkland, shouted the Grand High Witch. She herself, I noticed, had not taken off either her wig or her gloves or her shoes. Witches of Inkland, she yelled. The audience stirred uneasily and sat up straighter in their chairs. Miserable witches, she yelled. Useless, lazy witches. Feeble, fribbling witches. You are a heap of idle, good-for-nothing worms. Dahl's widowed mother took him to the mountains and fjords of Norway every summer. Decades later, as he settled in Buckinghamshire, nature was still important to him. Coming here has really made me realize how much Dahl must have loved nature. He chose to live surrounded by fields and trees. And I know he was a great lover of country walks. It really gives you time to think. For me, I like to think when I'm swimming, but he probably loved to think while he was walking across these fields. Dahl's Norwegian background also made him an outsider, with an outsider's ability to see the world differently. His first children's book came from him sitting in his hut and thinking, why do fruit stop growing? You know, why, why don't they just go on growing and getting bigger and bigger and bigger? And he didn't feel that science provided all the answers. I mean, science provided some of the answers, but his, his mind was always open to the idea that we don't know that, that trees aren't screaming when you, cut, you know, when you saw a branch off. We don't know that, that, that grass doesn't feel pain when you mow the lawn. He, he, he was always looking beyond the, 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 the surface for something, and so magic very, very quickly came into his life. It is a sign of the master. He sets a rule. It's his world. Everything that happens, happens the way he says it's going to happen, and you don't argue with it. You go with it. You know, wherever, wherever that peach goes, however high it flies, even when it ends up spiked on top of the Empire State Building, it's there because he says it's there. And, and that is the pleasure of reading the books. You never question Dahl. You just go with him. Every year at Dahl's old school, the Cathedral School in Landaff, Cardiff, the children bring to life one of Dahl's stories that subverts the laws of nature. Golden gloss shampoo? Yes! Toothpaste? Yes! Super foam shaving foam? Yes! A vitamin In George's marvellous medicine, yes. George is fed up with his grumpy grandmother and thinks he can cure her with his own special medicine. Berry seeds? Yes! The original ingredients are so disgusting and foul, we've made a few substitutions. Horseradish sauce? Yes! Okay, let's do it. You find the engine oil, pour a little bit in. No, that's good, pour it all in. Um, what should we go with next? Let's, everybody, let's all grind up these horse pills. Well done. You just smash them in the bowls. That's right, just give them a good old smash. More, more, more. Let's give it a stir. Okay, would you eat that? Maybe not. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> wow, looks lovely, doesn't it? Next, I think, is curry powder. Should I try it? Should I see what it tastes like? Shall I? No? <laughs> it's more fun than normal lessons, isn't it? George stood in his bedroom, gazing at the shambles. There was a big hole in the floor and another in the ceiling. And sticking up like a post between the two was the middle part of Grandma. Her legs were in the room below, her head in the attic. I'm still going, came the old screechy voice from up above. Give me another dose, my boy, and let's go through the roof. No, Grandma, no, George called back. You're busting up the whole house. To hit with the house. She shouted, I want some fresh air. I haven't been outside for 20 years. With a hay nolly now and up we go, she shouted. Just watch me grow. Uh, oh. 
<laughs> Imagine if the um, headmaster did actually eat it. He probably would. If we put it in his coffee, he probably would. <laughs> <laughs> however wacky the inventions, however ridiculous the events, all Dahl's stories are believable. They may not be realistic, but they are believable. Dahl has this amazing understanding of what makes kids tick. So he can create worlds that they believe in. He has the most extraordinary ability to see the world as he did when he was a child. Roald Dahl didn't just write legendary children's books. He co-wrote the screenplay for Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, stamping on it his unique storytelling. He created the infamous Child Catcher, who wasn't in the book. I think the Child Catcher is one of Dahl's greatest creations, and I think it's possibly the greatest villain in cinema. And it's, it really kind of speaks to what's brilliant about Dahl. But a lot of people are quite dismissive about him because he doesn't use beautiful description, He's not psychologically subtle. There's not a lot of um, the, sort of the finer arts of writing evident in Dahl. But he's got this thing that very, very few people have got where he can just go straight to the nerve. I mean, the child catcher, is, it just seems to be speaking to your nervous system. It's like that, that injection of adrenaline in Pulp Fiction that just thumps into your chest and he just seems to bypass all your cognitive abilities and, and really rattle you in a visceral way and that's a, a very, very, very rare gift. Dahl's fascination with extreme characters can be seen right from his years at school. On Landorf High Street, Dahl visited his local sweet shop. In his autobiography, he recalled it as being owned by a Mrs. Pratchett. Today, it's a Chinese takeaway. Dahl described Mrs. Pratchett as a small, skinny old hag with goat's legs and black fingernails. Her blouse had bits of breakfast all over it, toast crumbs and tea stains and splotches of dried egg. She would say things like, I'm watching you, so keep your thieving fingers off them chocolates. You do wonder if Mrs. Pratchett inspired many of Dahl's darkest creations. So fired up was the young Roald that he masterminded the perfect revenge on Mrs. Pratchett, leaving a dead mouse in one of the sweet jars. Found out, Dahl was sent to the headmaster for punishment. Dahl remembered. It felt, I promise you, as though someone had laid a red-hot poker against my flesh and was pressing down on it hard. But despite these experiences, he never lost his anarchic spirit. This is a letter Dahl wrote to his mother in 1930 when he was 13. You seem to have been doing a lot of painting, but when you paint the loo, don't paint the seat, leaving it wet and sticky, or some unfortunate person who has not noticed it will adhere to it, and unless his bottom is cut off, unless he chooses to go about with the seat sticking behind him always, he will be doomed to stay where he is and do nothing but shit for the rest of his life. Now already you can see Dahl is inviting the reader into the world of his dark and surreal humour. It's really, really fascinating that he kind of gets an idea and he runs with it. He's visualising it already. He's visualising someone with a seat stuck to their ass. <laughs> it's funny. Quite inappropriate, really, for a letter to your mother, age 13, especially the use of the word shit in 1930. But this is the birth of a genius. Everything I heard from people who remembered the Dahl household um, leads me to think that it was a pretty chaotic, riotous place. I mean, his school friends said to me, gosh, you know, to go and stay at the Dahls, it was like staying in a madhouse. Some of them found it quite shocking because all the kids swore like troopers and uh, Sophia Magdalena didn't seem to give a damn. And I think that was, that was very important to him because 
he was used to a home environment that had no rules, and he really, he really kicked against rules, anybody telling him what to do most of his life. I think it's not to, to put too fine a point upon it. He hated school. I think he really, really had a bad time there. I'd also like... Uh, you have to do this, Omnia, you have to do that. Yeah. Matilda, one of his last books, is a story of a brilliant child, her beastly parents, and nasty headmistress, Miss Trunchbull. What's she look like? Nasty little worm, I'll be bound. I have discovered Miss Honey during my long career as a teacher that a bad girl is a far more dangerous creature than a bad boy. What's more, they're much harder to squash. Squashing a bad girl is like trying to squash a blue bottle. You bang down on it and the darn thing is there. Nasty, dirty things little girls are. Glad I never was one. Mm. So that's Miss Trunchbull, and she's got to be the most evil teacher in the world. Yeah. yeah. Roald Dahl was physically and mentally hurt by the way in which he was treated at school. There's no question of it that you can see in the way he writes about beatings and so on. So he's poured all this into Miss Trunchbull, and then by exaggerating it, in a way, you make it safe. As it is psychologically from his point of view, if you exaggerate something, you end up laughing at it. Dahl's extreme characters have been brought to life through the illustrations of Quentin Blake. I think Matilda, we did, I think that's got the, the most, I think there's a, I think, I seem to remember there's a hundred drawings in that. It's one of the longest it? of his books. Yes, Which he was very pleased. It'd be well, interesting to look at the process of how he describes Miss Trunchbull and then how you drew her. Yes. She's one of your most sympathetic characters, isn't yes, she? Yes, I try. No, no, I, I'm very close to her. Yes. <laughs> she was, above all, a most formidable yes. female. She had yeah. once been a famous athlete, and even now the muscles were still clearly in evidence. You could see them in the bull neck, in the big shoulders, in the thick arms, in the sinewy wrists, and the powerful legs. Looking at her, you got the feeling that this was someone who could bend iron bars her. and tear telephone directories in half. This was another moment where we changed it a bit, or where Ra changed it, because he, he, when he described her, she was like a... Um, I think she had a collar and tie, and... Um, and I... Well, I, 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 I did a slight moustache, but I'm, I'm not sure whether that was in, in the text or whether I made that up. <laughs> I don't think you'd be that cruel, Quentin. I think that must have been wrong. Well, he, bring, he brought out another side in me, so... <laughs> um, but... Uh, and so that the, the presentation was very masculine, and I think that um, when, when we saw this, Rod said, "Now she's she's got to be terrible, but she's but has got to be a woman." So we get yes, that's right. We gave her the, that she actually does have a, a a feminine hair style. I mean, a female hair style, and then. Rod found a, some a photograph of someone wearing the sort of costume that she that she is is wearing with um, this rather, I, I invented that nasty buckle on the belt actually, which is, which is sort of. It kind of contains it, doesn't it? Really? Yes, that's right. And then. Um, Could you sort of bursting out even if. Yes, that's right, yes. Yeah. And, and then the, 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 the cuffs and the. Great big hands. The, uh, is it more fun drawing the kind of monstrous characters or the sort of larger-than-life characters than the kids? It's it's different. Yeah, I mean, you 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 need that roughage in your diet. I think really, it's it's interesting. You can modify the dose, as it were. They are caricatures, you know, frightening caricatures. Um, but they're slightly less frightening because they're caricatures in a way. Is it know? hard selecting which? bits to illustrate or is it very natural on your first read? No, it's, it, it, it takes quite a lot of thought. I think, right. I think it's an important bit of the job, actually. Um, and, um, I mean, I, there's that as an example I've, I've quoted in the past where the, the 
the boy has eaten the whole chocolate cake, you know, and, and <laughs> Miss Trunchbull is so annoyed about that that she picks up the empty plate, bashes it over his head, and, of course, he's kind of anaesthetised with the chocolate cake, so it's all right, you know, again. But, but I thought, I don't want to draw that. Um, I'll just draw her lifting the plate, you know. So we all have the, um, the pleasure the moments, of anticipation. Yeah, yeah. You know, kind of thing, so. I know what you mean. You yeah. don't want to see that yeah. illustration yeah. of the plate connecting before you've no, read that passage. No, no, no. that's right. Matilda was written in the mission control for Dahl's creativity, his famous hut. The interior has recently been relocated to the Roald Dahl Museum. What really strikes me about this writing hut is how ramshackle it is. There's an electric heater hanging from two wires from the ceiling, an angle poised lamp that's broken, so Dahl's attached a golf ball with some sellotape to it to weight it. There's fossils, part of his hip bone, shavings from his spine. And of course, he's got his special yellow American legal note paper and his pencils. It actually speaks of someone who doesn't necessarily find it that easy to write. It's all very ritualistic. It's almost like he's saying, I can't create the magic unless I have all these things around me. Dahl wrote to a daily schedule, gambling on horses in the afternoon. But in his hut, he was a disciplined, great craftsman. The simplest stories can be the hardest to write, and Dahl's books could take many drafts. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, one of Dahl's first books, took two years to write. It's like treasure, isn't it? I know. And as you can see, it was originally called Charlie's Chocolate Boy. And well, it's, I think it's totally he, different. he was right to change the title, wasn't he? <laughs> well, you changed the whole plot as well, so... So is it very different from in this, yeah, the other Yes, very, very different. So, so how do the drafts change, um, you know, over time? Well, in this version, there are ten children. Oh, um, and then in the next draft, there, it goes down to seven. And then in the final published version, there are just five, five children, yes. including Charlie. You like this one. So this is technically the third draft. Okay. And you can see, it's down to... Um, Seven children. Yes, and, and he lists them. Charlie Bucket, a nice boy. August Gossip's Gloob, a greedy boy. Marvin Prune, a conceited boy. Herpes Trout, a television crazy boy. Now he changed the name from Herpes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think quite sensibly, as this is a children's story. So, how radical was this book at the time? Well, it was totally different from anything that anybody else had ever written or, or, and that the reading public had ever seen before. The themes were considered too adult for children, but the fact that the, you know, the main characters are children ruled it out as a, an adult book, an obvious adult book. Uh, and, and also just the way his writing style, it can just seem terribly rude and shocking. When you first, if you come across yeah, it's it, it's very blunt, isn't it? Yes, so, the way the way all the children just keep disappearing, and they're, where they've gone to is never explained. That's the bit I love the most. Well, yeah. actually, you think you see them at the end, sort of, they they're all sort of misshapen, and then they sort of you know they they come back into the factory. But but I think as it happens, you do think they've all been killed, I, I which is why children like it so much, of course, and that's why a publisher's mm. going to be scared initially. Yes. This is, as it was published, apart from a last-minute change when Roald Dahl goes through all the manuscript, well, typescript, and he crosses out all these Whipple scrumpets. Whipple scrumpets become Oompa Loompas. Yeah. <laughs> and they were so nearly Whipple scrumpets. Yeah, that's so much better. That's interesting, isn't it? But also, when you think, minute. exactly, and, but he was still on the case, still thinking of, mm, of improvements. How, how he can make it better, yeah. Even when he was, you know, ostensibly satisfied. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? The fact he's just 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 crossed it out and written and put it. I know. Can you imagine he just obviously was just him? sitting in yeah. his oh. in his house and goes, "Umpalumpus." Finally. But it's great he got there before the book was published because sometimes, mm. having written a few children's mm. books, you you sometimes deliver them and then you go, "Oh, I should have done that." I know. When it's too oh. late. Not only did Dahl have difficulty in publishing Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, but when it came out in the early 1960s. Many librarians refused to stock it, thinking it crude and unsophisticated. I love 
of chocolate. I could have some right now, like five bars of chocolate right now. The squirrels pulled Veruca to the ground and started carrying her across the floor. My goodness, she is a bad nut after all, said Mr Wonka. Her head must have sounded quite hollow. Veruca kicked and screamed, but it was no use. The tiny strong paws held her tightly and she couldn't escape. Where are they taking her? shrieked Mrs Salt. She's going where all the other bad nuts go, said Mr Willy Wonka. Down the rubbish chute. Do you think that's cruel that Veruca gets put down the rubbish chute? Yeah. But she's a bad child, isn't she? Yeah, but she's not a nut. She's not a nut. She's not a nut. No, she's not. There's a fine line, and, and you just have to try to find it. You never describe any horrors. You have some you, you, happening. You just say that they do happen. You, you cannot let evil triumph. For children seeking a moral compass, it is right there amidst Willy Wonka's chocolate temptations. Isn't that what grown-ups are dreaming of? In our Western society, all we can think about, it seems to me, is how you can get more money and get more things. And how in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, or Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, how you can see how this can go badly wrong. How some of the children who won those golden tickets had a dreadful time. As with Charlie's golden ticket, everything can change in a moment in Roald Dahl's stories. The same was true in his life. Roald narrowly avoided death from a crash landing when he was an RAF pilot. In an article, he claimed to have been shot down, but the reality was he had run out of fuel. What mattered was, what's the best story? And for him, definitely being shot down was, was a better story. He rewrote it, he improved it, he changed little details, but, the, but, but he, he wasn't gonna change the, the, the being shot down to, to, I crashed my plane in the desert. The accident left Dahl struggling with pain for the rest of his life, as can be seen in this replica of his writing art. Dahl had his chair specially adapted because he was in so much pain due to his flying accident. He had a blanket wrapped over his legs. It's a bit like being strapped into the cockpit of a fighter plane. Maybe Dahl was flying away, flying away like Charlie in the Great Glass Elevator, flying away from tragedy and flying into his imagination. Dahl's son Theo would also have a near-death accident. In response, the ever-creative Dahl co-invented a device, this valve, which has since saved thousands of lives of sick children. Within a few years of his son's accident, Dahl was creating the bizarre machines in Willy Wonka's factory. Theo survived, but then at seven years of age, his daughter Olivia caught measles. Dahl's handwritten account of the doctor's struggle to save her was found after his death in a drawer in his hut. Called Philip Evans, he called the hospital, called me back, shall I come? Yes, please. I said, I'd tell hospital he was coming. I called. Doc thought I was Evans. He said, I'm afraid she's worse. I got in car, drove to hospital, walked in. Two doctors advanced on me from waiting room. How bad is she? I'm afraid it's too late. I went into the room. Sheet was over her. Doctor said to nurse, go out, leave him alone. I kissed her, she was warm. I went out, she's warm, I said to the doctor in the hall. Why is she warm? Of course, he said, I left. That's a really harrowing account, isn't it? I think the economy of it is what's so ghastly that he couldn't 
handle trying to fictionalise it in any way. He just had to tell it as it was. So Olivia died, she was seven, she died in 1962. Yes. Um, how do you think her death affected him and his writing? Tragedy had been part of his childhood too. So he had, I feel all his writing displays a very strong sense of the importance of family and how blessed you are when that's going well. And I think that his, his sister died when she was very young. Um, and of course he, he lost his father when he was young as well. He lost his father, exactly. Tragedy had been, and difficulty, had been part of his upbringing. He knew bad things happened and he could, he could countenance in fiction them happening to bad people. He thought the world wasn't a fair place, so the books themselves perhaps occupied more of a moral universe than they would have done if he hadn't had those tra tragedies, because he thought, why should awful people get away with things? Why should they? Was and he judgmental in real life? He was quick to make judgments, yeah. He was quick. People were either good or bad. There weren't many shades of grey with Roald. After Olivia's death, Dahl's first wife, Patricia Neal, almost died after having three strokes while pregnant. Mr Fox looked at the four small foxes and smiled. What fine children I have, he thought. They're starving to death and they haven't had a drink for three days, but they're still undefeated. I must not let them down. I, I suppose we could give it a try, he said. <gasps> Let's go, Dad. Tell us what you want us to do. Slowly, Mrs Fox got to her feet. She was suffering more than any of them from the lack of food and water. She was very weak. I'm so sorry, she said, but I don't think I'm going to be much help. You stay right where you are, my darling, said Mr Fox. We can handle this by ourselves. Dull the Patriarch led his family through this terribly tragic time. Like any parents, he had his faults, but family was very important to him. Soon after this time, he wrote Danny, Champion of the World, this gypsy caravan in his garden, features heavily in the story. And soon after that came Fantastic Mr Fox. Both are about heroic fathers leading their families through adversity. I, th I think without doubt you can say that every child is torn about all sorts of feelings about their parents. Every page in Danny Champion of the World talks really about a love for a man who has problems and the son, in a sense, is able to help his dad or go along with his dad and so on. It's an incredibly caring, loving book about someone in difficulty, namely the dad, more so than the boy. He really digs into a relationship there and a set of actions that you won't find in many books. Powerful stuff. Dahl's books resonate with their emotive and moral worlds, and they are always, always wickedly funny. <laughs> when Roald Dahl started writing for children, he broke all the rules. Let's see Red Riding Hood splattered over the wall. Let's have Cinderella with her head on the floor because actually we're fed up hearing their tedious stories year after year in pantomime and, and everywhere else. And, and finally, here's a writer who took them and gave them what they deserved. Delightfully subversive, deliciously disgusting, mildly malevolent, you name it. He was all those things, yes. As a comedian, I've spent a lot of time trying to work out how to say things that, if said in a serious way, would be completely unacceptable, and I haven't always gotten away with it. In Dahl's world, a grandma can be poisoned by her grandson. Parents can be eaten by a rhinoceros, and yet, somehow, it's acceptable. It takes a true genius to pull that off. You are the axis of evil. You are to be in prison. You are a rotting lump of pure wrong! You are the dark heart of all that is unholy in this land. A black hole of wrong-headedness. 
Dahl's book Matilda, about a spirited girl facing the evil headmistress, Miss Trunchbull, has now been adapted as an award-winning West End musical by musician Tim Minchin and writer Dennis Kelly. <laughs> the school of late has started reeking quiet maggots when I'm speaking, reeking with a most disturbing scent. Only the finest nostrils smell it, but I know it oh too well. It is the odour of rebellion, it's the bouquet of dissent. And you may bet your britches this headmistress finds this foul odiferousness wholly olfactorily insulting. And to so to stop the stenches spread, I find a session of phys ed, sorts the merely rank from the revolting. Very good. <laughs> that is so fantastic, and that does seem like pure doll. <laughs> what do you think are the key ingredients to a doll story? Just when it, it'll go somewhere quite dark and then think, I'm gonna go a bit further. And he sort of takes <laughs> it just a little bit further, and I really yeah. like that about it. Like if you look at the twits or something where, you know, they end up Dead. I mean, they end up, they end up in it's their quite own. Quite a lot of shoes. death in, in his book. Yeah, it's very yeah. dark, and it's and uh, and in Matilda, you sort of think, that, you know, the superpower thing. Did he just sort of get there and think, I'm going to give her a suit, you know? And, yeah. and sort of, and there's, there's, it's a nice sort of sense, really, of of like someone once said to me that the thing about Dahl is that he relishes things, you know, and that really stuck with me for this. Like he relishes, you know, you know he, he likes worms and and burps and things, and like he relishes that sort of stuff. Yeah. And in a way, you do as a kid as well, don't you? You like yeah. that sort of stuff, you know. And that's uh, for me lyrically and and even musically, this sort of idea of living in this onomatopoeic world where everything rustles and shrivels and scribbles and squaggles, you know, like that's what it was for me. When you, even when you're describing him there going, yeah, your face goes, oh, he likes this, he likes this, and he likes going, Arr. How important is humour to telling this story? Uh, humour is, it, does, it sort of doesn't work without it, you know, it's sort of, um, you, you need, uh, you, you need it to sort of let you do all the sort of dark stuff. Yes, yeah, they, they sort of work side by side, you know. And, and actually, they, there's a there's a moment in it. Um, there's a moment where Matilda's telling a story to uh, Miss Phelps, and she gets really caught up in the story, and, and the story gets really dark, really, really dark, you know. And ev you can see that Mrs. Phelps is really offended, really upset by it, really, you know. The entire audience is like that, and then Matilda turns around and goes, and then it got worse, and the audience <laughs> just does exactly that. They all they crack up. Oh, I mean, Dole says at the beginning of the book that. Um, he gets Matilda saying that children's books should have always have humour in it, doesn't he? Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah, you can't, and you so can't. Yeah, humor it's really important. Humor. And you can't have a despot like Trunchbull and not yeah. have her also be funny. Otherwise, she's just Hitler, you know. There's a song in which I can't, I can't remember because I wrote it very quickly one day. But there's a chant in it that goes, "There's a place you are sent if you haven't been good, and it's made of spikes and wood, and it isn't big enough to sit. But even if you could, there are spikes on the bottom, so you wish you'd stood." <laughs> and it's like this, and it's just hell, it's just fire and brimstone, right? But it's totally like ah, and it's completely silly and over the top. But it's if without the jokes, it's child abuse, you know. Like, <laughs> without the jokes, this is a story about adults being terribly abusive parents and terribly abusive teachers who throw children out windows by the head. It's such an incredible balancing act. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun, huh? Fantastic, yes. Yeah. It's got to be exciting, it's got to be fast, it's got to have a good plot, but it's got to be funny. It's got to be funny. It is only such finely tuned dark comedy that can stand the test of time. And it's interesting to see the, the kind of connection between Roald Dahl's writing and Dickens's writing, which is also fantastically funny. The stories are laced with sadness, tragedy, loss, death, extreme fear, darkness, and hysterically funny observations. And I think that this is the essence of great storytelling for young people, certainly, but also for, old, for older people, for grown-up people. So the sooner you can start reading it, I think you might start with Dahl and move very easily onto Dickens. Maybe start with Dickens and slip over into Dahl. <laughs> It is easy to underestimate the challenge of writing for children. As Dahl sealed himself away in his hut, he became a magician, carefully crafting worlds full of fantasy, humour and morality. He was a master writer who threw off the constraining rules of the adult world, just like a child. I 
think there are two types of people on this planet, two types of adult. The ones who remember being a child and who still dream like a child and have ideas like a child and enjoy things like a child and the ones who have forgotten all that and are just adults. And I know which ones I prefer. The second category are probably politicians or bankers. Children love to daydream, and sometimes adults do too. Who hasn't thought about running wild and defying rules and authority? And maybe that's why Dahl has such an enduring appeal and such a mass appeal, because he understands there's a dreamer and a child in us all. He looked as though he'd been blown up with a powerful pump. It's so horrible. Great flabby folds of fat bulged out from every part of his body, and his face was like a monstrous ball of dough, with two small, greedy, currenty eyes peering out upon the world. <laughs> Outrageous. No wonder children like them. Bye. <laughs>